The Mike Wagner Show is powered by Sonic Web Studios. Hi, this is Mia Mohsen Zia, also known as Mia No Time for Love. Check out my latest book, Missing, available in print and ebook format on Amazon. It's now time for the Mike Wagner Show, powered by Sonic Web Studios and sponsored by international award winning author Mia Mohsen Zia of Missing. The Mike Wagner Show can be heard on over 40 podcast platforms, as well as HamiltonRadio.net, Diamonds FM, and the TheMikeWagnerShow.com. We can be heard in over 100 countries, featuring over 1,000 well-known and amazing guests throughout the globe, and named one of the top 100 global podcasts in the New York Weekly Times, Hollywood Entertainment News, Los Angeles Weekly Times, Apple, and Chartable. So sit back and relax and enjoy another great episode of the award-winning Mike Wagner Show. Hey everybody, it's Mike from the Mike Wagner Show, powered by Sonic Web Studios and brought to you by official sponsor of the Mike Wagner Show, international war-wing author Mia Molson Zia Missing, available on Amazon and paperback and ebook. We're here with a terrific gentleman who's a former director of ethics um, program at uh, Medical University in South Carolina and fa- faculty of uh, Center for uh, Biomedical um, Ethics and uh, Society at uh, Vanderbilt um, Medicine. He also taught philosophy and religion for 20 years and published um, a number of uh, articles in bioethics, philosophy, and religious studies. And uh, he was also founding executive director of um, a free medical clinic, uh, basically a healthcare advocate for the homeless and a 25-year hospice volunteer. And he's also got a new book, which takes you into the field of uh, suffering. It's an empathetic and encouraging and empowering a guide for everyone called to do healing work, either as a career or purely out of love. And the book is called Into the Field of Suffering, Finding the Other Side of Burnout. And this is a really critical time um, for those caring for loved ones and more. Live, ladies and gentlemen, from Plus Studios um, in beautiful downtown North Carolina, somewhere in the wonderful state, uh, former director of ethics program at Malcolm University of um, South Carolina and the author of the book, Into the Field of Suffering, Finding the Other Side of Burnout. Ladies and gentlemen, the multi-talented David Shank. David, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Thanks for joining us today. Yeah, good evening, Mike. Great to be with you. Well, it's great to have you on board as well, too. You're a former director of ethics program at Medical University in South Carolina and also a faculty for Center for um, Biomedical Ethics and Society at uh, Vanderbilt uh, Medicine. You also taught philosophy, religion for 20 years, published a number of articles in um, bioethics, philosophy, and religious studies. And you also found an executive director of a free medical clinic, um, healthcare uh, advocate for the homeless and a 12, 25 year hospice volunteer. And your book is an empathetic, encouraging and empowering a guide for everyone called to do healing work either uh, as a career or out of love. And your book is called into the field suffering, finding the other side of burnout. We do need a lot of care at this time. You've been in for quite some time. And before getting to all that, David, tell us how I first got started. Well, Really, the way I got started in this is a personal experience. My, When I was 18 years old, my father died uh, suddenly of a stroke. No, you know, no um, previous health history, no problems like that. And so my life changed from, uh, you know, I was on the way to politics. I wanted to be the next Bobby Kennedy, right? <laughs> yeah. I, I think they'd be a great time to do it right now. Anybody wants to be a Bobby Kennedy yeah. or any kind of Kennedy at this point. Why yeah. not? <laughs> yeah. um, and so my my life really just turned around completely. And I decided to uh, study religion and philosophy and really try to understand suffering and try to understand uh, death. And that mm-hmm. was part of it. The other thing is we had a very bad experience in the hospital with uh, oh. a couple of the doctors. And so that has stuck uh, in my mind and in my heart. And it's been something that has in teaching medical students, teaching residents, working with medical staff. Uh, it's something that I have taken as a priority. Mm-hmm. And, and can you tell us uh, what, what happened in the era of uh, doctors? What was the situation and how did they air, air in it? Sure. Um, so my father had a stroke on Saturday night and they decided to do a surgery on Sunday morning. And uh, they started the surgery and they came back out very quickly, uh, which is not a good sign. Uh, 
And we were standing in the hall. We weren't even in the waiting room. And the lead surgeon said, uh, your father's had the, your husband, your father, my mother was there, has had one of the worst strokes I've ever seen in my life. Really? Uh, never recover. If he lives, he'll be a vegetable. So y'all just need to decide whether to uh, take him off life support or not. Uh, and he walked away. And we were standing there in the hall. Uh, people were walking back and forth. He didn't explain the operation. Uh, and there was another physician there who said, gosh, isn't there a place we could let them sit down and talk about it? And then I finally found a little, basically a closet for me to sit down with my mother. And we decided to take him off life support. But it was uh, it was a compounding pain and piece of suffering and insult on top of what was already a horrible uh, situation. And, and, and how did it, how did they know it was the uh, worst stroke possible being your dad was in perfect health, great shape and everything like that. How did it be suddenly be uh, the worst possible stroke? Was it genetics? Something happened? Or did they explain it or anything? Um, they, the second physician explained it later. He had, he was born with a, aneurysm in uh, let's see they described it as a berry aneurysm i'm a phd not an md so you know the, mm -hmm. this layperson's description but there's a ring of uh, artery at the base of the brain and there was a weakness in the wall of that when he was born oh. and it could have uh, exploded when he was three years old or 80 years old and it happened to happen uh when he was 43 but at the base of the brain it affected uh really uh, everything and the fundamental life uh, supporting functions. Mm -hmm. Do you think they could have done something about it to uh, detect the problem since it was detected? Do you think that could have been, um, was it possible for them to uh, take care of it right away or was the situation delicate or anything like that? Um, it's conceit. Well, we're talking about 1970 mm -hmm. uh, in medicine today. Uh, it's conceivable that something could have been done if somebody was there immediately but uh, there was another physician involved who probably missed what was going on. That didn't help. Um, but essentially, uh, there was not a whole lot that could have been done. He had had a very thorough physical three or four months before that by an excellent uh, physician, faculty member at uh, UNC Chapel Hill, and nothing was detected. So that, that was part of the uh, power of it was that it was completely unexpected and devastating at the same time. Mm -hmm. and it sounds like you went through a lot as well too. And, um, you know, besides, you know, you know, sitting down with your, uh, the physician, the surgeon and, you know, the really uncomfortable situation. And what else was that one precise moment that simply, um, led you to being, um, a hospice volunteer, a caregiver and, um, and everything like that, you know, being in the hospice field. Well, it was an effort in the beginning. It was an effort to heal myself, uh, to get uh, reoriented back into my life. Uh, there was significant depression, as you would expect, for, for, for several years. And trying to understand how I could recover and then looking around me to say, what have the religions of the world had to say about suffering uh, what has philosophy and great philosophers had to say about it? Uh, can this help me get somewhere? Um, what can happen with therapy? So there was a period, uh, a long period of really intense personal exploration, which then became a resource when I began to work uh, as a hospice volunteer, when I began to work in the free medical clinic and began to work in the hospitals. And, you know, one of the themes of the book is using your wounds as a resource, as a way to offer something to uh, the people that you're caring for. And it was my own exper experience of using my own wounds and pains that led me to talk about that and explore it in the book. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it sounds like you pretty much, you know, explained it related and everything else that, um, you know, the importance of knowledge on woodenness. And you also um, 
empathy. There's also um, overload and burnout and everything, gratitude and um, some uh, exercises to heal as well. It's all part of the book, Into the Field Suffering, Finding the Other Side of Burnout with author David Shank. We'll get to that in just one minute. But first, listen to the Mike Widener Show at the MikeWidenerShow.com. Studios.com for all your needs. Look at a professional website without breaking your budget. Sound like web studio. Affordable custom web designs that blow the competition way. Call today, 1-800-303-3960. It's 1-800-303-3960. Or email to support at sonicwebstudios.com. Mention Mike Widener's show, get 20% off your first project. Sonic Web Studios, take your image to the next level. Also, time to give an official shout out to our official sponsor of the Mike Widener show, international warring author, Mian Malsenzia. If you love fast-paced mysteries, you love Missing by Mia Molson Zia, available on Amazon and paperback and ebook. Missing is fast-paced and intriguing with an unforgettable twist. It takes place in four countries, two strangers, one target, where truth is illusion and those who love be the first go missing. It's available on Amazon and paperback and ebook. Missing by Mia Molson Zia has garnered great reviews. And Eve 11 enjoys by how its celebrities, including Joanna Cassidy, Forge Riley, and Mills. So grab your copy today, Four Goes Missing by Mia Molson Zia. Available on Amazon. Also, check out the Mike Widener Show at themikewidenershow.com on our 40 podcast platforms. We're in 100 countries, including Facebook, SoundCloud, Spreaker, Spotify, iHeartRadio. Also, LinkedIn, YouTube, BitChute, Rumble. Make sure you subscribe. Also, on um, Apple uh, Podcasts, Podbean, Buzzsprout, Pandora, TuneIn, and all the 40 podcast platforms, iHeartRadio, and more. Make sure you take us with you on any mobile device. And for great gift ideas, go to Amazon.com. Check out the Mike Widener Show podcast. T-shirts, pop sockets, throw pillows, tote bags, hoodies. Makes great gifts 24-7. Go to Amazon.com. Check out the Mike Widener Show podcast. And for more great gift ideas, go to Amazon.com slash Mia Melsonzia for great books like Missing, Once and Wrinkles. Also, T-shirts, pop sockets, hoodies, phone cases, and more. Great for the holiday season, birthdays, or any occasion. Amazon.com slash Mia Melsonzia. Check it out today. And support the Mike Widener Show on Anchor FM, PayPal, and the Mike Widener Show.com. We're here a former director of ethics program at Melkin University of South Carolina and also author of the book, Into the Field Suffering, Finding the other side of burnout on the Mike Wagner show, author David Shank. And uh, before we get back to um, more of your book, and uh, you've uh, taught for quite some time, and um, you know, you know, philosophy, religion, twenty years, and um, also you worked um, Vanderbilt uh, Medicine, and of course, you know, he also taught for twenty years. Um, what do you think students, you know, got out of the the experience, and what do you think, you know, if you're taught today, what would they do? So, you know, just overall teaching and everything like that. We'll like hear more about it. Let me talk specifically about a course that we did at Vanderbilt called Death and Dying. Uh, this was a course for undergraduates, and uh, we had 25 students. Part of the requirement was that they volunteer at hospice for um, 20 hours during their uh, during the semester. Uh, part of what they had to do was keep a journal about their experience. Part of what they had to do was interactive uh, exercises in the class. But what we had was a group of 20, 21, 22 year olds going to sit with people who were dying. So this wasn't a class that was conceptual or reading alone. What we wanted was something that combined direct experience with some reflection in the classroom with some readings. And it was a remarkable experience to teach because we watch these young people grow in enormous ways. Part of what was interesting was they would say, well, you know, I'm not a doctor. I'm not a nurse. So, you know, I, what am I going to talk to them about? Uh, and we would say, you're a free gift to them. You aren't coming in to do something to them. You aren't a family member where they may have some tension or you're just a young person who's there to bring in a piece of the outside world that they've been cut off from. So be yourself, talk to them. You don't have to talk about something heavy like what's the meaning of life and how do you feel uh -huh. about that after life? Talk about, uh, the football game we went to talk about, you know, your ice cream, you know, whatever. And it was lovely to watch them build out from that. And some of them had really uh, remarkable experiences 
Uh, there was a group of young women who visited an older woman who gave them dating advice and what they <laughs> need to do. And, I like and, that. <laughs> yeah, how to find a boyfriend. Um, it was uh, it was a really a privilege uh, to work with them. So that was one thing. The when before that, when I taught undergraduates, part of what I tried to do was to introduce not only Western philosophy, but Eastern philosophy, and introduce, uh, of course, the topic of, of suffering and to uh, bring them into awareness that there were a lot of traditions about this. Uh, but one interesting thing, Mike, was that, you know, I would teach this kind of course for 18 to 22 year olds, and I would get more of an intellectual response. They were trying to figure something out. But for a couple of years, I taught in a community college, and I had students who were 28, 29, 30, uh, early 30s. Many of them had, uh, you know, they'd had a couple of jobs and they'd had to do something else. They had uh, been married and had to go back to work. They had been divorced. And so when I stood up in the front of the room and said, uh, the Buddha said that life is suffering, they all perked up. It was like, we know that. <laughs> we, we have been through, talk to us about that. So I love teaching those students who had already experienced some of the things that these traditions were talking about. Hmm. That is rather interesting coming from both ends of the spectrum and um, er er everything like that. And of course, you know about the, the situation with the healthcare industry. And I like the idea of, um, free medical clinics and especially um being a healthcare advocate for homeless and uh tell us more about that and what exactly inspired you to um start the free medical clinics i had done some work in my postgraduate year on medical ethics what is now called bioethics and what i thought at the time was the most serious ethical problem in medicine was access to healthcare uh, mm -hmm. Uh, disparities of access, uh, rural versus urban, racial disparities, gender disparities. And so in the community where I was teaching, uh, a group of churches came together to start a free medical clinic. And I thought, here's a place to put some of the philosophical work I had done and awareness about ethical issues uh, Put it to work, you know, see how it works on the ground, learn this. And this has been a theme for me, really, is to go back and forth between the classroom, the reading and philosophy and religion. But I always want to test it. How does it work on the street? How does it work in the clinic? How does it work in the hospital? Because if it doesn't work there, I'm not so sure what it's worth. So the free medical clinic was an opportunity to understand what it was like for people to be uninsured and the block uh, the things that blocked them from getting their medical care, why they were uninsured. Many of them were working full time, but in this was ninety two to ninety six, mm -hmm. uh, you know, no Obamacare, and so. Uh, they might be working full time and working as hard as they could, but they couldn't uh, buy their insulin or their blood pressure medicine. Uh, and so we made it a point to get people those medicines to keep them out of the doctor's office and out of the hospital. Uh, but we also ended up picking up people who had not been to the doctor for years and years and came in with very advanced uh, cancers, things that were wow. tragic, uh, things that you you know, if it had been picked up a decade before, they might have been able to uh, do something. The other great thing about it was it was white churches and black churches. It was a variety of denominations. Um, the synagogue was involved. The Unitarian Church was involved. And it became a really visible activity in the community, and it was able to pull people together, not just on health care, but other issues in the community where healing uh, was was needed. Mm -hmm. and, and especially the uh, homeless as well, too. That's another big problem, especially in California. 
it's growing by leaps and bounds. It's almost like a suburb. And then I was reading a story where I think along Sunset Strip or uh, wherever it is, it's almost like it, it's like they're having their own own city within a city. And it's getting to be, be like where it's getting to be bigger than Anaheim. Mm -hmm. Well, the tent cities uh, are a phenomenon really everywhere and have been uh, for decades, although it's gotten uh, clearly it's gotten worse. The affordable housing is a critical need in all of our cities. And it's a critical need for teachers and firefighters, you know, the, the people who make the community work. Many of these communities can't afford to live there. I mean, even in a small town like Asheville, North Carolina, uh, there's an influx of retirees and wealthy people that want to be in the mountains. And the teachers, the firefighters, the policemen uh, who really make the town, hold the town together, uh, can't afford to live there. Uh, but then, you know, somebody is out of the job for a couple of months. They're laid off. Uh, they can't make their rent. Uh, they can't make their mortgage payment. And the next thing you know, they're on the street. It's not like um, this is some weird species of people who have failed in the world. This is you and me. You know, if if we uh, get laid off, if, you know, the hospital does layoffs and they decide to get rid of ethics, you know, David Schenck is, uh, is out there. So I think it's important to try not to be judgmental about many of these folks. Uh, there is a lot of substance abuse, but if you live on the street, it's hard to make it unless you're stoned some of the time. <laughs> uh, so it's really, it's an enormous human tragedy uh, on an individual level, but it's also uh, a tragedy and a failure on the part of our communities. Mm -hmm. and, and it's also taken a toll on um, doctors, nurses, healthcare workers, and um, hospital workers all across the board. And there's a, just a massive overload. And there's also a, a shortage as well, too. And it's also taking a toll on caretakers. And, um, you know, I guess just the ways, you know, you know, what can we do about it? How can we help them and everything? It's just like, you know, there's a free health care, but then it's also you have a shortage and also a, a a pretty high burnout rate among hospital workers, doctors, nurses, and the like. Well, we've seen uh, just recently the strike with uh, Kaiser Permanente hospitals, uh, people talking about the amount of coverage that they're asked to do. Um, so let me give you an example. You know, during COVID, uh, there was difficulty staffing, you know, so you're uh, or I'm a nurse in the intensive care unit and I'm used to working with two patients. You know, I sit at my desk and I have a window into one room and I can see that patient and into the other room. But during COVID, uh, there's not enough staffing. And so they say to me, could you just cover one more patient, day, you know, just down the hall there? And uh, because uh, Joe is out today. Um, so I do that and I do that for a while. And it's an emergency and, we, and we're doing the best we can. And then they come and they say, you know, we really, uh, so-and-so is home sick and uh, so-and-so just couldn't do it anymore and has moved to Florida uh, or North Dakota. And uh, <laughs> Hey, we can use some nurses up here. It's like they're more than welcome right. to come up. That is right. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, could you cover two, could you cover four patients instead of three? And so I'm thinking, okay, I'll just do this for a little while. But then COVID is over, but we're still having trouble getting back to our staffing levels. Meanwhile, the hospitals, profit-making institutions have realized that, you know, David and Mike can, they can cover three or four patients. They, oh my goodness. Why, why just have them cover two patients? I mean, they, for a year and a half, uh, Mike was covering four patients. Let's just kind of keep them stretched out. And so we have this situation where people really are totally overworked and the patient care suffers. And in addition, the caregiver suffers because he or she knows that they're not delivering the kind of care that they could deliver and want to deliver. So it's a double or triple problem. Uh, it's exhausting. It's overworked. 
but it's also a sense of not being able to do what you were called to do and trained to do. Mm-hmm. And, and it also leads to a part about, uh, you know, burnout and everything and uh, some of the signs, the warning signs, and especially your body as well, too, that um, there's also um, how I identify your hot muds where it's just like, you know, people press your buttons or people make you burn out and also listening to your body. All these things are important. People, you know, people ask, how, how can you tell that you're on the way to burnout? And one of the words that we try to, terms we try to introduce in the book is depletion. Uh, as you get tireder and tireder, the energy and the inspiration that keeps you going gets depleted and you're on your way to burnout. That's a kind of lead up uh, to burnout. And one of the clearest signs uh, are, are body things, like you're saying, physical things, not sleeping well, being tired even after you sleep not eating well, uh, pains in certain areas, you know, people, uh, certain people have stress and they feel it in their shoulders. Some people feel it in their knees, things like that. But the other thing to pay attention to, I think, as you feel that you're stressed is your coworkers. Uh, What I say is look in their eyes. You can tell if they're worried about you. Sometimes you can tell that they're disappointed David isn't working like uh, he always does. We we count on him for this. Uh, we're having to work to cover for him. And also your patients. You know, your patients will have a sense that you aren't doing well. And they may not say, look, Dr. Shane, get with it. You know, you, you're, you're uh, fouling up here. But you can often tell. Um, the things that drive to burnout moral distress is a big one. And this is uh, something that we try to address in the book. What is moral distress? It's classically a situation in which you know or you're convinced that something needs to be done for the patient, but it's not being done, either because the institution isn't willing to pay for it, you don't have the equipment for it, or Perhaps you're a nurse who sees, you know, you're with the patient 12 hours in a shift. The doctor comes in for five minutes in the morning, might check in briefly in the afternoon, gives you some orders, and you're bound by those orders for the full 12 hours. But, you know, Mike, the nurse is there thinking, I know this isn't good for this patient, but you've got the orders. So the discrepancy between what you think or know needs to be done for the patient and what's being done is the kind of classic thing for moral distress. But a term that we introduce and like to talk about is what uh, is moral anguish. And that, uh, to me, is when you internalize it, when you feel a conflict within yourself, you take it home, the emotional turmoil that is within you uh, is an additional pain. And that is a, <clears throat> is a driver for burnout as well. That is a depleting uh, experience. Mm-hmm. And, and certainly indeed as well too. And of course, you know, I remember the days that uh, nurses were specifically trained, well-trained and everything like that. And, and do you think it's, um, you know, the way they train is contributing to, um, to the client in healthcare. It's like, you know, fast, fast, fast and everything like that. Or do they still t- treat, teach the same, but it's like people interpret different, especially nurses. Mm-hmm. Nurses, It's really interesting if you look at the code of ethics for nurses versus the code of ethics for physicians. And the nursing code is very patient-centered. It's very much uh, paying attention to how the patient is, giving priority to what the patient needs. The, I don't want to knock physicians too much, but the American Medical Association code of ethics is more focused on competencies and the integrity of the practitioner, which is important, uh, truly important. But the training for physicians and nurses tends to have uh, a different focus. Now, 
you can say, and it's true, that uh, physicians get more scientific training. But here's an important question. In caring for a patient, is your grade in organic chemistry more important than your ability to have a trusting relationship with another human being? Mm, probably not. Uh-huh. And, you know, I would have, I have said to cardiologists and heart surgeons, uh, you guys are trained really well. You're absolutely brilliant. But there is nothing that you can do that can't be undone by a patient. And if you can't build a relationship with a patient, you can't count on them to do their part. So learn your technical skills. That's great. But also learn how to build relationships. Mm -hmm. And make sure they don't press your hot buttons as well, too. And if that were to happen, it's, you know, you know, you know, how how would you handle hot buttons and uh, what you do in that situation? There are some people who are just looking to uh, find more about it. Right. Well, I uh, just a story about this. When I was running the free medical clinic, I was going through uh, a divorce, which is, you know, there were a lot of challenges about that. And I honestly did really well with almost anybody that came in the door. Uh, African-American, Caucasian, Asian, Asian-American, babies, old people, blah, blah, blah. There was one group of people that I didn't do very well with. People that were about the age of my, on the way to being ex-wife. And I always got tangled up, you know. And it wasn't like I was looking for trouble or anything, but it was just, uh, there was so much going on in my life that it was just uh, a hot button. And it got to the point that my assistant, as soon as somebody, uh, you know, like my wife, white woman, roughly my age and so on, would come in the front door, Laura would say to me, I've got that one, David. (laughs) She knew it was going to be a problem. So, Uh, That was a workaround for us. But what you need to do is, uh, what I encourage people to do is to go into those emotional places, those places where you're still hurting, you're wounded. It's like uh, you've stubbed your toe and it hasn't recovered yet. And every time you bump it, it hurts. And so go back in, try to understand the original what hurt you in the first place? It's not the person pushing your hot button. It's not the person who walks in the door of my clinic that's the problem. It's what's going on in my life, in this case, the divorce mm-hmm. situation. So the best thing I can do for the avoid the hot button situation and to help the person walking in the door is to work on my own stuff. So that's what I encourage people to do. And it's also important to know that you have hot buttons. If you don't, then you're going to blame the other person all the time. <laughs> Those patients, you know, that guy, Mike, he's he, he's a real problem. It's actually probably David that's a problem. Mm-hmm. Or, or it could be that person, that person and everything else. And of course, you know, another question you ask is, is, uh, is health care or hospice worker for me? We're going to into the field of suffering, finding the other side of burnout. You listen to the Mike Widener Show at the themikewidenershow.com, powered by Sonic Web Studios, and brought to you by our official sponsor, the Mike Widener Show, interactive warring author, Mia molson We'll be back with author Dr. David Shank of uh, Into the Field of Suffering after this time. The Mike Wagner Show is powered by Sonic Web Studios. If you're looking to start or upgrade your online presence, visit www.sonicwebstudios.com for all of your online needs. Call 1-800-303-3960 or visit us online at www.sonicwebstudios.com to get started today. Mention The Mike Wagner Show and get 20% off your project. Sonic Web Studios, take your image to the next level. Hey everybody, my name is Forbes Riley and I'm an American actress and a TV host. And I was delighted when I got my copy of Missing, which is Extraordinary Relation of Ordinary People based on a real life relationship. It's just, it's well written, it's amazing. You know, it talks about a man who has lost his wife and his daughter 
and it's very well done. I'm gonna highly recommend that you go get your copy of Missing. It is a powerful, exciting read. Mr. Mian Moshe Zia, he is the author of Missing. And I wanna give a big shout out and a kiss all the way halfway around the world to my dear friend. Check him out at Mia's website. It's called www.miamotionzea.com. Missing, available on Amazon. Again, I'm Forbes Riley, and I will see you again soon. Bye-bye. Hey, hey, this is Ray Powers, and boy, are you in luck. Right place, right time. Tuned in to The Mike Wagner Show. You heard me. We're back with author David Schenk of uh, Into the Field of Suffering, Finding the Other Side of Burnout on The Mike Wagner Show. And, of course, you know, book, your book is an empathetic, encouraging, and empowering guide to anyone call the do uh healing work either as a career or purely out of love and um you, you know the fact that uh, you know you know how, how would you know that uh, person be called the do and um you know basically it's uh just want to say is that you know how, how do you how's a person know it's for them one of the things that i would almost always do in um conducting a workshop for nurses is i would say when did you first know that you wanted to be a nurse? When was, you know, when was the, the first sign? And the range of responses was very interesting. I mean, some people said, you know, my mother was a nurse and uh, her mother was a nursing assistant and my aunt was a midwife. So there was a family thing. Mm -hmm. Some people said, well, for women in my community, there were two choices for work, teaching and nursing. I, oh, I remember that. Yes, I think that was like, oh, my gosh, that was going way back when. Yes, yes. But, you know, I was doing these workshops in rural Tennessee, and uh, this was something many women described. And, you know, some of them tried teaching and they said, oh, my God, seventh graders, forget it. I'm going to be a nurse. <laughs> But other people described how, as in elementary school, children who got hurt came to them for comforting. They sort of radiated uh, around them without even trying uh, a willingness to be helpful, to be kind, to be compassionate. Uh, and so that was an interesting thing that some people knew from really very early on. And then there was a group of people who... I remember one woman in particular who had been an accountant and had a really wonderful job. And uh, in her early 30s, she thought, what am I doing? Why, why, why am I doing this? And she quit this really quite, you know, outstanding job and went back to school and got her nursing degree because she had experienced one part of the work world but wanted, uh, as she put it, uh, to have a sense of a different kind of sense of the moral worth of her own work. Uh, so people would come to it very early, like in elementary school, or they would come to it uh, more or less in midlife or mid-career and uh, make a reversal. Mm -hmm. That sounds that sounds really interesting. I know of a lot of people to make their career change, you know, 30s, 40s, 50s, some do it even their 60s and 70s. So there's really no limit to that. And of course, you can volunteer and uh, you can almost like do it any time. It's like it doesn't hurt to a volunteer, you know, like say one, one hour a day, one hour a week or even up to 20 hours a week. Just like, um, you know, my case, my uh, my gr my grandfather, he worked in lithographing for 40 years, retired, and then he really wanted to help people, be around people. He simply volunteered at a hospital and treat like it was um a job 20 hours a week. Right, right. The volunteers uh, bring something very special. Uh, they bring, part of what they bring is generosity. What you've just described, a, a person who's worked hard, had a good career, and now wants to give of themselves in, in a whole different way. And that, uh, you know, one of the great things in life and in caregiving is where people have vulnerability and people are coming in, like you've described, with generosity and vulnerability meeting generosity. This is one of the beautiful things about uh, human beings. And 
volunteers bring that and experience that. I mean, we, we ran the free medical clinic, uh, entirely with volunteers, volunteer doctors, volunteer nurses, volunteer, uh, screeners, um, volunteer chaplains. We were, and it had a very special spirit to it because of this generosity that, that all these people had. Hmm. That is rather interesting too. And of course, you also co-authored um, some books. You also have a gift of uh, writing. You helped with uh, healers, extraordinary clinicians at work and what patients um, teach everyday ethics of um, healthcare. And a uh, bit about that, you seem to have a pretty good flair for writing. I love writing. Uh, and I have since, you know, junior high school. Uh, one of the first things I did, uh, of course, I had the... Uh, Ninth grade breakup with the girlfriend. <laughs> I started keeping a notebook, you know, pouring out my soul and my misery. Uh, and I have kept notebooks. I've probably filled hundreds of notebooks, most of which I've burned or thrown away. But writing as a way of understanding myself, understanding the world. And early on, I did a lot. I mean, in elementary school, they pushed us to do public speaking. And so uh, I was doing public speaking from early on as well. And the process of trying to formulate my thoughts was really uh, important. And then I was fortunate enough to find people to teach me and to guide me and to give me feedback saying, um, yeah, this does offer something important. Or sometimes they would say, look, David, this is, you know, like, this is not, do something else, you know, <laughs> write something else. But it was, um, it was an introduction to or a way of moving into communities and getting conversations started. It was really a healing activity uh, for me. That's, that's one thing to say about it. Mm -hmm. and, and what can uh, people learn from the book as well, too, into the field suffering, finding the other side of burnout? What can people learn from it? Well, I think there's something to be learned from the title itself, uh, Into the Field of Suffering. Uh, sounds like a weird title for a book. You know, why would you pick up a book that said, okay, let's go into the field of suffering? The field of suffering. So remember uh, back to the first time you went to visit somebody that was sick. You know, maybe it was a school friend. Maybe it was a grandparent. Um and before you went in the sick room, there was this, okay, I'm going to cross a line here. I'm going to go into an unusual space. That is what I mean, what we meant by field of suffering. It's kind of like a magnetic field. There is what's going on in that person's life. And when you step into it, you absorb it and it surrounds you. And, you know, uh, sometimes it's, it fills your nose, you smell, you know, things don't smell so good. <laughs> uh, if you're touching the patient, uh, you have the kind of physical contact, if you're listening and looking. But healing begins when you enter that field of suffering, because as soon as you're there with the intention of being present and being helpful, the room changes. This is why uh, you visit sick people. This is why when you're ill, you like for people to come see you. Um, so the field of suffering is uh, an image or a way of talking about the bodily experience of being around people who uh, have had their lives uh, upended. And part of what caregivers um, need to have is the willingness to enter the field of suffering and the ability to stay there and be present to the patient. And that's the case in healthcare. But, you know, all of us are caregivers at one point or another. We care for our parents. We care for our children, our siblings, our partners. And, and, and even pets, too. It's like, you know, that's a first start. You know, like your, your first uh, cat, first dog, first yes. bird, gerbil. Yes lizard anything like that there's a caring involved too or even like you know i've seen people you know care for bugs <laughs> right and all those creatures have fields of suffering right 
you know, one of the times, one of the ways that many of us learn about uh, death for the first time is the death of a pet. You know, I remember walking out uh, to feed the dogs in, in the backyard uh, and uh, one of the dogs is just lying there, you know, just sort of stiff. And I'm like, you know, what is this? And this was my, you know, this was my first acquaintance uh, with it. So we all care in one way or another and learning how to stay with what we're seeing and what we're feeling inside of us. Uh, this is a really important part of, of being a human being. Hmm. That is rather interesting. We're getting a lot of great information. And uh, David, where can we find your book and all he works at? Uh, best place to find it is either Amazon uh, or Oxford University Press uh, website. Those are the two best places to find it. Okay, we'll certainly check that out. We're with author David Shank of uh, Into the Field Suffering, Finding the Other Side of Burnout on the Mike Wagner Show. Just a few more things, David. What else can we expect me in 2023 and beyond? The book, the book concludes in with a series of conversations. Uh, my co-author, former student of mine, now colleague and, and really good friend, Scott Neely and I, the book was built on 15 hours of recorded conversations between the two of us. And so we wanted to close the book with the idea that the conversation continues. So there are five conversations there, and then it's an invitation for, you know, Mike to continue conversations with his friends and so on. And part of the movement there was to explore more of the uh, spiritual growth that can come through the process of caregiving and being present to those who suffer. And so I think that that's a direction that the writing uh, may take, ne uh, take next. I've, I've been uh, mulling around some ideas to pitch to my editor at Oxford, uh, Lucy Randall, great editor. So that's one direction that, uh, that may, uh, you know, that I may be taking. Okay. Well, that's rather interesting uh, as well, too. And who do you consider your biggest influence in your career? Well, you know, I like to say that I haven't had one career. I've had a series of improvisations. Mm -hmm. And so there are several different people. Um, Charles Reynolds, one of my professors uh, during graduate school, was really formative for my sense of what it was like to be in the academic community teaching and as an administrator. Uh, Lucian Brailsford, the medical director at the Free Medical Clinic, was an exemplar of service and kindness and compassion and generosity. Mm -hmm. uh, powerful, well-known surgeon and two nights a week for years, he's down at the free medical clinic supervising the medical staff and taking all the most difficult patients himself. And uh, a hospice nurse, Priscilla Norris, who again uh, had a, a gift of being present, but also just totally no nonsense. I mean, here's what she said. You know, I love hospice, because there's no room for BS. <laughs> you just I like have, that. Yeah, you just have to go straight to it and be honest and be real. And watching her do that, and, you know, it's like, I hope I can be like Priscilla some of the time, at least once or twice. So those are some of the important people in my life. Mm -hmm. That's very amazing. I like that part. No BS. I have to put that to my perspective. Oh, yeah. so <laughs> and she didn't use the abbreviation either. She right. Yeah. I, I think that was tactful too, right there. So <laughs> and what's the best advice you can give to anybody at this point? Uh, appreciate yourself for your caregiving. Appreciate yourself. Often caregivers are giving themselves a hard time. You know, I haven't done enough. Why didn't I do more for so-and-so? Why didn't I do more for so-and-so? The fact that you're willing to be present and to offer what you can offer is uh, greatness. It's human greatness. And so 
be good to yourself. Appreciate yourself. Be grateful for the chance um, to serve and to care. Mm -hmm. And that's a very great point, especially in times like these. We're with author uh, David Schenk of the book, uh, Into the Field Suffering, Finding the Other Side of um, Burnout on the Mike Wagner Show. David, a very big thank you for your time. You've been absolutely fantastic. Learned a lot from you. Looking forward to having you again soon. Keep us up to date. Keep in touch. Once again, what's your website? How do people contact you? Where can people purchase or check out your works? Uh, best place to purchase is amazon.com and uh, of course in the oxford university press website and getting in touch with me the best way to do that is through oxford university press all right we'll certainly do that as well once again david a very big thank you for your time you've been absolutely amazing looking forward to having again soon keep us thanks, up to date mike. keep in touch love have you back wish all best and david you definitely have a great future ahead of you thanks mike good to have good to be here the mike wagner show is powered by sonic web studios if you're looking to start or upgrade your online presence, visit www.sonicwebstudios.com for all of your online needs. Call 1-800-303-3960 or visit us online at www.sonicwebstudios.com to get started today. Mention The Mike Wagner Show and get 20% off your project. Sonic Web Studios, take your image to the next level. Hey everybody, my name is Forbes Riley and I'm an American actress and a TV host. And I was delighted when I got my copy of Missing, which is Extraordinary Relation of Ordinary People based on a real life relationship. It's just, it's well written, it's amazing. You know, it talks about a man who has lost his wife and his daughter and it's very well done. I'm gonna highly recommend that you go get your copy of Missing. It is a powerful, exciting read. Mr. Me and Moshe Zia. He is the author of Missing. And I want to give a big shout out and a kiss all the way halfway around the world to my dear friend. Check him out at Mia's website. It's called www.miamotionzea.com. Missing, available on Amazon. Again, I'm Forbes Riley, and I will see you again soon. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to The Mike Wagner Show. Brought to you by international award-winning author Mia Mosenzia of Missing and powered by Sonic Web Studios. Be sure to join us again on over 40 podcast platforms and, of course, on the MikeWagnerShow.com, HamiltonRadio.net, and Diamonds FM. Don't forget to support our program with a generous donation at the MikeWagnerShow.com. Thanks for listening.